Hello, um, I am George Heffernan of the Philosophy Department of Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts. And we are having this evening our ninth annual Cassisiacum Dialogue. The topic of today's dialogue is the book, The Monks of Tiberine, Faith, Love, and Terror in Algeria. This is one of the great human stories to emerge from the recent past but it is also an account, um, a timeless account, of understanding between Christians and Muslims. And our guest for the occasion is the author of the book, John Kaiser. Well, thank you. I'm very happy to be here, George. We have a few questions, and I think uh, the first question is, um, can you tell us in a few words what the story is of the monks of Tiberine? Uh, I think you could condense it by saying it's, a, it's essentially it's a, it's a love story wrapped in a horror story. But it's not a love story of uh, the uh, Hollywood uh, romantic uh, variety. There's nothing about the sap rising in this story. It's, it's about fraternal love, uh, universal fraternal love, which is what Christians are supposed to be about, but uh, frequently aren't. And um, uh, so I found in this story a... a um, both a lens through which to understand better the Christian faith as lived by people who have given themselves to God, and to learn uh, through the eyes of these monks something about Islam, Algeria, and France's tortured relationship with, uh, with its former colony. Um, so it's a, it's a story, a faith in action story, it's a political story, it's a cultural war story. It's a story of inter-Islamic inter conflict. It's a story that, uh, 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 that, that foreshadows all the things that we're involved with today. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how did you come to write this story? What drew you to it? What circumstances or interests on your part? Well, essentially, the book, when I look back at it and what drove me to write it, it's, it's, it's actually a long prayer of mm -hmm. gratitude for what was probably one of the best years of my life spent in France. In 1994, I took my wife and family, and we spent a year uh, near Nice in saint paul de vence It was a, uh, a very productive year of doing nothing, at least nothing in the usual sense of the word. Um, I went to France with two goals. One was to sort of get Expose, expose myself and my children and my family to a different culture, and to uh, finish reading the Bible, mm. <clears throat> which I had started reading several years before and found it was a difficult book to understand. I'm trying to reconnect to my own Christian faith, which was always a fairly light one at best. And uh, in France, uh, I met a wonderful Catholic priest by the name of Antoine Costa, who uh, really inspired me to think more seriously about what it means to be a Christian, answered a lot of questions that I had in a way that satisfied my brain as well as my heart. And it helped, helped me sort of draw closer to uh, my, my own Christian tradition. Um, and I found my experiences with him and this group that I became part of very, very enriching. Um, and I also was very, uh, very uh, much, uh, well, like a lot of people, I enjoyed living in France, French culture, and I was very interested in the tensions that were taking place in French society, having to do with their Algerian minorities, their historic problems with Algeria. Mm. And uh, so, to me, Algeria was kind of the French Wild West, a, uh, mm. uh, a, um, an opportunity to going to go off on an adventure that was both mm -hmm. spiritual and political, to learn about Islam, to learn more about uh, what it means to be a Christian, at least if you're a Trappist monk, and to get inside of that world. I think a question that a lot of people would have, a natural question, is uh, what were Trappist monks doing in a uh, almost exclusively Muslim country in the first place? What, what, what brought them there? What kept them there? Well, what brought them there was uh, French colonialization that began in 18, 
30, and then 10 years later, a little 10 years later, they they uh, invited the monks to come to Algeria to uh, help persuade uh, the uh, natives that the French weren't all atheists. Uh, mm. the, uh, the, uh, the Arabs were very uh, sort of uh, put off by the lack of uh, there being uh, any sign of French uh, uh, devoutness towards uh, you know, their maker. Uh, where are their marabouts? Where are their mosques? Where are their places of prayer? Why don't the French pray? So uh, the, the monks were recruited, in essence, to both uh, demonstrate to Algerians that, uh, in fact, uh, France was populated with believers, and uh, here are some of our best, and, and also they happened to be good agriculturalists. And uh, they also won the hearts of lots of uh, Arabs because of their tradition of hospitality and the way they live their life, their piousness and uh, their, their religiosity, and, and uh, they helped them out when there were crises and famines and stuff. So they were, they, they behaved like good Christians and won, uh, won the admiration of many uh, uh, of the Arabs that uh, were around the monastery. Um, the order left Algeria in the 1880s and uh, ended up in uh, Yugoslavia. They left in the 1880s because France was going through a spasm of anti-clericalism and uh, uh, a lot of uh, orders left France, came to Canada, came to the United States, well, went to places where there were more friendly climes. Mm -hmm. And then the monks that were previously, these mo or this community, not the same monks, but the community that had been in Slovenia, uh, came back to Algeria uh, in the uh, 1930s when uh, uh, communism was starting to uh, uh, present its face in, uh, in the Balkans, and uh, they decided that they wanted to go to, back to a, a, uh, another country where they might be more welcome. Mm -hmm. So 18, 1938 was their re-entry, and they had been in this uh, community uh, since, uh, you know, for over 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, now, given the critical financial situation in Algeria in the 1980s and um, given a lot of the social and religious turmoil there and violence, especially after 1989 and into the early 90s, uh, why, uh, despite the warnings, repeated warnings on the part of the French government and the Algerian government, why did the monks decide to stay? Well, they, I think they stayed out of a sense of uh, loyalty and duty to their vows, which was uh, were vows that included the vow of taking the vow of stability, of poverty, uh, and charity. Um, and uh, they also had developed close personal bonds with, with uh, their neighbors, uh, with whom they lived in a kind of symbiotic relationship. The neighbors would, the neighbors would do things for the monks, the monks would do things for the neighbors. Uh, they worked in their fields. Uh, they were kind of an extended family. Um, but uh, so you had this sort of a situational uh, reality of a family uh, that uh, went beyond the walls of the monastery. But you also had the, uh, the urgings of their bishop, who, uh, when they initially wanted to leave because of an incident that uh, scared the pants off them, uh, just said, you know, before you uh, bolt, uh, think of the impact you're going to have on other Christians because you're a much admired community, you're kind of the leaders in, in Algeria and the Christian community. And, uh, and then think about your vows. I mean, what, what sort of poverty is it if you can leave and your neighbors, you know, can't? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what sort of poverty is that? You can go stay in the Holiday Inn and, you know, they're stuck mm -hmm. here in, the, in this uh, environment mm -hmm. of uh, fear and loathing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they all reflected on that. And, and, uh, and, and, and after uh, uh, 24 hours of reflection, they all came back to their superior and they said, well, you know, we're not really comfortable with the idea of leaving. And they, they decided to then, every six months, kind of reassess the situation and decide whether to... But it's a personal connections. And it was, you know, like, you know, why does a mother stay with a sick child who's got some horrible disease? You know, it was a, a sort of a maternal love of neighbor and uh, they stayed as long as the neighbors wanted them to. If they had been asked to leave, they would have left. But as long as the, the, uh, the neighbors, who were all Muslims, uh, asked them to stay, wanted them to stay, or didn't ask them to leave, 
they were they call it duty. Uh, can you say a few words about the concrete events of the turn of the year 1995 into 1996 and you know, give us some background um, about uh, the, um, uh, the initial uh, encounter with um, terror, terrorism, and then um, the events of the spring of 1996, um, be a little more specific about the details and why uh, the monks, even when things, uh, even when acute danger turned into uh, a very, very great peril, they still persisted in their vow of, um, of, um, of stability. Um, that they're, 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 the fact that they saw themselves as tied to a certain place, uh, to the service of a certain local population. Well, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a tall order. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think in, in, embedded in all this is, is you have to keep in mind the sense that they all ultimately came together and saw themselves a bit as living uh, a sacrificial life. Mm -hmm. that they were giving themselves to God. Their lives were not taken, they were given. Mm -hmm. And that was the way they often talked about the deaths of other mm -hmm. members of the Christian community who stayed on out of a sense of duty, loyalty, um, uh, calling, as that uh, their lives weren't taken. They, mm -hmm. Now, what were the circumstances? Well, I mean, the circumstances were, uh, you know, a very nasty um, inter-Nicene war, insurgency uh, that had been sparked in 1991 when the uh, military government uh, uh, annulled election results that would have uh, given the FIS, which was sort of the Islamist uh, front party, uh, if not control of the parliament, it would have given them a significant uh, 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 representation in the parliament and, and there were fears that, you know, if, that they might, that that, that could uh, unleash uh, all kinds of uh, sort of a Lebanon scenario within the government because a lot of the military people were sympathetic with the Islamists. I mean, there was a lot of bad government corruption, um, uh, bad economic management that had caused deterioration of, of uh, conditions in, in, in uh, Algeria in the 80s. And, and uh, so this was essentially you know, a revolt against uh, uh, an abusive, uh, badly run government that uh, wasn't uh, doing anything to help the poor people. And it was also viewed as a kind of neo-colonial leftover because uh, one of the more annoying and, and insulting aspects of, of, of living in Algeria, if you weren't one of the elite, was that if you didn't speak French, you couldn't get a job. And, uh, and the Algerian government was constantly bringing in high-paid foreigners to do things that you know, many of the Algerians thought they were capable of doing. So they were. There are a lot of uh, social, economic, and political issues that then erupted uh, after 1991, and um, and the uh, the guerrilla movement, the insurgency, uh, you know, uh, was initially supported by much of the pop urban pop. It's basically an urban movement, and uh, 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 the. Um, the population supported the, uh, the movements uh, for the most part, but as it got more and more violent and more and more indiscriminate and, uh, and more and more uh, uh, un-Islamic in the mm -hmm. eyes of the population and the targets that they would pick and like killing nuns and, and priests was horrifying, as mm -hmm. well as killing women, Muslim women. And so the whole thing just became so uh, excessive that the population started to you know, turn away. Uh, but but uh, while the monks were there, uh, there were several incidents that um, uh, you know, were, were terrifying, and one of them was uh, Christmas Eve, 1994, and uh, that was when some terrorists broke into their compound and uh, wanted money, wanted medical assistance, um, and uh, their their superior stood up and confronted the, uh, the uh, head of this insurgent group and said, you know, uh, mm. you, know you can't have money, we don't have any money, you, know, you can have medical assistance, but you have to come here, we're not going to send our doctor out of the bushes. And, um, and uh, faced him down and said, you can't come into our uh, buildings with your weapons. Mm. And, uh, 
And uh, there was a very moving scene in which uh, the uh, head of the, uh, this uh, band says to the you know, apologizes for, and he said, by the way, you're also interrupting our celebration of the prophet Jesus. And uh, this big terrorist with uh, his bandoliers and Kalashnikov and knife, you know, uh, is essentially uh, um, put in his place by this man of God who he obviously respected and who uh, reminded him of Islamic law, and um, which is not to, you cannot bring weapons in place of worship. And, uh, and, 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 uh, Atiyah, the name of the uh, leader, said, you know, apologizes, excuse me, and, and uh, by the way, we don't regard you as foreigners, you are mm -hmm. believers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were left alone uh, after that, but, but uh, in the meantime, uh, the monks didn't realize they were going to be left alone, and uh, they were uh, terrified as to... Uh, Mm -hmm. what the consequences would be, because he had said, I'm going to send my representative back and do some more negotiating, and um, they didn't know. They figured they were, you know, they were likely to be killed later, so mm -hmm. they had went through this ongoing process of reassessing their situation, calming down, uh, and uh, suffering uh, like everybody else in the neighborhood mm -hmm. who worried about, you know, whether they would be kidnapped, killed, you, um, you've mentioned several times, I think, now the sacrificial character of the lives of the monks of Tiberine. And um, I did notice in reading the book that very early on, um, in, on one of the first pages, you seemed to make a point out of saying that the monks were not martyrs to their faith. But then later on, and I find this very interesting, and I don't think it's a contradiction at all, if you know what I mean, um, you, you devote an entire chapter to them as martyrs of hope. Um, for, the, for some readers, that might seem like an inconsistency. I don't think it is, and I don't think that you think it is. Um, you know, today we live at a time when it's common for some people to talk of martyrs as people who kill others for their unbelief. Uh, originally, the basic sense of martyr was someone who died for their own faith. Um, so, can you say a few words ab about clarifying that shift? In other words, not 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 martyrs to their faith, but martyrs of hope. Um, um, basic sense of martyr being witness. Um, well, it's a semantic distinction that the uh, the superior Christian de Cherge I think made mm -hmm. uh, and felt mm -hmm. was important, and, and I think what he he wanted people to understand was that they weren't being killed because they were Christians. Mm -hmm. uh, that can be discussed, but but that mm -hmm. was the view that they uh, that, mm -hmm. that they were they were killed for possibly many reasons. We don't actually know, but in fact, we do know that other Christians were killed. People, you know, ecclesiastics, although they were a small percentage of the foreigners who were killed, they were killing foreigners in general, mm -hmm. and occasionally they decided to knock off a nun or a priest. Um, so you could say, well, obviously they're, they're more as their faith because the Muslims are killing Christians. Uh, but it's not that simple. And, and what, what they, I think, want to enter, uh, underline is they were martyrs of love because they knowingly uh, took the risks, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that took on the risks that uh, they knew they, they had to, to uh, confront. And all of these communities knew it was dangerous, not necessarily because they were Christians, but because they were foreigners mm. in Algeria w under the permission of the Algerian government and sense some, in some sense serving the government's interests. So any, any foreigner and any government worker was considered by some of the, uh, some of the terrorist groups as fair, fair game. Mm. Anybody who was there who was from France, Especially Russia, after they thought that they had given what they regarded as fair warning that they would be targeted. That's right. They had yes, given yeah. fair warning. They said, yeah. get out of town. you got 30 days or we're going to start killing you. And uh, so the, the, the Westerners who stayed had been given fair warning. Mm. Uh, the monks um, were never actually f threatened by the, um, uh, by the local terrorists. They never got a note. The terrorists, generally speaking, were quite reasonable about it. They would let it be known that certain people were going to be targeted and the word would get back to them and mm 
They had a choice, either stay or leave. Mm -hmm. Monks never got that message mm -hmm. because they had lots of informants among the friends, the friends that they had who kind of protected them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, they were martyrs who, who, in the sense that they were willing to live their vocation even unto death. And if you read Christian's uh, letter, uh, his testament mm -hmm. that he wrote two years before, in fact, he was killed, mm -hmm. in which he acknowledges the risk that he's taken. He acknowledges that uh, that uh, if he were to die, it will probably he he bemoans the fact that this will be interpreted as another yes. example of Islamic yeah. fanaticism, mm -hmm. and that these people that he loved, you know, killed him. Um, or even that he really did not desire or strive for any kind of martyr's death. Like, no, yeah, he yeah. wanted to live, but he mm -hmm. knew that living his calling uh, uh, faithfully uh, entailed the good possibility of being killed. And he, he wrote that out, you know, and he said, upon my death, uh, give this to my family. Mm -hmm. And give it to the newspapers, actually. Mm -hmm. and, and that was a very moving. Mm -hmm. And he... And, and of course, he couldn't have done this if the if the other brothers weren't willing to go along. I mean, he wasn't mm -hmm. imposing his will. The other brothers uh, had all kind of coalesced around Christian's mission of serving God by seeking the face of God with Muslims, sharing in their spirituality, which mm -hmm. was driven by the fact that uh, he had this uh, traumatic experience as a soldier in France and Algeria in, the, in, in 1960 when he was serving in civil affairs and. He, he and a Muslim uh, policeman with whom he had uh, regular conversations mm -hmm. about their faith and their belief in God uh, was surprised one day by some of the falagas, the FLN, and they were going to kill him. And his Muslim uh, friend uh, basically protected him and told these people not to kill him, that he was a friend of God, a friend of the Algerians, and that he was you know, a good man. And then the next day that Muslim had his throat slit. And to him, that was a, 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 an example of the universality of Jesus' sacrificial love, that the spirit of Jesus is everywhere, mm -hmm. not just among Christians. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so he saw Muhammad as a sort of Christ-like figure, and it, it had a deep impact on his, uh, the direction his vocation it took. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other monks uh, all had different sort of experiences of their own, but they came, they coalesced around a, a feeling that they did have a commitment to serve God in Algeria and to live in fraternity with their Muslim neighbors and to live their vows to the end, and they did it. Mm -hmm. um, in the interest of um, yeah, going to all the extremes, going to all the limits to understand the other perspective, uh, and, and this might disturb some people, uh, but let's try it anyway. Um, there's the GIA communique uh, where, uh, and the GIA is the group that is mostly held responsible by most people for the, the kidnapping and killing of the monks, um, although we'll never know the full truth, I think. Uh, um, in that communique, there is a kind of rationale for the killing of the monks, namely that they were proselytizing, uh, not in the sense of going out and preaching the gospel to people, but in the sense of setting such a good example by living together in fraternal love with their Muslim neighbors. Um, once again, in the interest of taking it to the limits and taking to the extremes, um, can one give that rationale any credit? Not really. I mean, it, it claims to be drawn from Ibn Tamiyyah's writings, and Ibn Tamiyyah was a very, considered a very conservative uh, cleric who did a lot of writing in the post-Mongol era of the Middle East, and he had his own problems, I guess, uh, to deal with, and, and his writings reflected that. But um, uh, I, I think there's, I don't think anybody seriously, you know, mm -hmm. believes that they were proselytizing, and if you stretched the meaning of the word proselytizing mm -hmm. uh, far enough, I suppose you could say that any form of behavior that causes other people to perhaps have a different view of what mm -hmm. you are, but no, they certainly weren't trying to convert anybody to Christianity. I don't think it even occurred to them, and I don't think uh, the, the neighbors had any particular interest in becoming Christians. They, to them, they were brothers. They were their babas, their mm -hmm. fathers, mm -hmm. and they just loved them as, as, as kind, hospitable, uh, 
uh, admirers of, 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 of the divine. And, and um, uh, I think that the rationale might superficially have been persuasive to some people, but I, I think the whole, the whole question of actually who wrote that memo is another mm -hmm. issue, whether yes. it was actually contract. There's actually a guy here in Harvard who very close to this whole subject, and his name yeah, now escapes me. But uh, um, anyway, it's, it was a very thin excuse. That I don't think it was mm -hmm. very persuasive, but it was part of their rationale. Mm -hmm. I, I guess one could see this as um, a French-Algerian, as an Algerian-French story. Um, and one could talk about you know whether it's more French or more Algerian. Uh, but I guess the question that for many uh, Americans, and this is a question that you raise at the beginning of the book, is, and it was actually the question that uh, Christian Marie's brother originally posed to you when you first met, according to the, uh, you know, the beginning of the book. You know, what, why would Americans be interested in a story like this? In other words, what, what, what would motivate, what, what would move Americans to be interested in the story? Why should they be interested in the story? Well, you actually said, why would Americans be interested in French monks? monks. Yes. And I yeah. said, well, I didn't think of them as really being French, that mm -hmm. the, these monks belong to you know, all of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, but I think the reason is that the, 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 uh, the issues and the circumstances under which they lived and, 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 and live their faith, uh, A, is dramatic and, and lends itself to a story, and, and B, is, is, a, is a very, to me, a very uplifting uh, story of, of um, Christian faith at its best, hmm. uh, at least in my view. I mean, it's not so much that they were monks, per se, but more that their attitude and their mm -hmm. uh, desire to be open to the spirituality of other faiths, in this case, obviously, Islam, and uh, their, their moral, their courage, their courage, mm -hmm. and uh, the reciprocal nature of the, of the love, and the fact that mm -hmm. ten years later, uh, neighbors are still keeping the flowers fresh at their, on their grave sites. Um, so I, I sort of saw it as an inspiring story uh, that, that, might, uh, that, that had the, the, sort of the good, bad, and the ugly on all sides. But it was sort of focused on the on the goodness of the monks, but also the goodness of many of the Muslims in the story too. So it's, it's not just these good monks; they were Muslims who sacrificed themselves as well. Uh, and uh, so I thought it, it was a kind of way to get into the nastiness of what's going on in the world today, but to attack it from an angle that is a little different, and not just emphasize the bloody, gory, and Mm. the nasty side and show that there's even in this kind of an environment love can I mean you read the if you read the letters of those Algerians the unsolicited letters of the Algerians that came into Tessier I mean, mm -hmm. you cannot not be moved I don't mm -hmm. know if you want to actually read one of them but it, it's, it's a very I don't have my reading glasses yeah, here I mean, but, <laughs> but here, here, <laughs> you here, know where they are here, they here, are, they they're, are here, here, here is yes. the, here's what yep. fanatical hate-filled anti-Christian uh, Muslims uh, had to say uh, when uh, they learned of the actually letters of protest saying this is not Islam. Let's see, let's see, uh, yeah. very moving. Some of them, I thought anyway. Mm -hmm. Does not God test those He loves? Wrote one. No matter what has happened, we truly love you. You are part of us. We have failed in our duty to protect you, to love you, and to love you enough. Forgive us. Your place is with us. Don't listen to the Pharisees. You must accomplish your divine mission with us. I believe it is God's plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Monsignor, it is disgraceful, truly shameful. The teachings of Islam are clear as to the sacredness of life, love of one's neighbor, hospitality towards strangers, whatever their religion. These are the true teachings of Islam, which have sadly been trampled upon by this handful of fanatics who daily befoul our reputation as a welcoming and hospitable people. We pray that you, Monsignor, will pass on to our Christian brothers in general and to the families of the victims in particular our message of fraternity and friendship. So, you know, this is to me what this book is all about. Mm -hmm. um, 
-hmm. that in the midst of all this horror, you still have this love. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask um, a more specific version of, or a more updated version of my last question, namely, um, the story took place uh, pre-9-11, and the book is also pre-9-11. How, ha how have the events of 9-11, but also the events of the aftermath of 9-11, how do they change the story? Um, uh, what, what can we learn from the story for the post-9-11 world? What lessons? Well, I think one important lesson from this story is that um, this is an intra-Islamic intra civil war that's going on in the world. And I think the more we try to get involved to solve it, the more we're going to probably make it worse. And what the French did here was smart. They stayed out. Even though in the summer of 1995, uh, half a dozen bombs went off in metros and places all over France, and several hundreds of people were wounded and not a few killed, mm -hmm. they didn't overreact. They didn't say, we got to send in the paratroopers. Um, their their uh, footprint was practically invisible. I mean, they did give some aid to the Algerian government, but it was, you know, mm -hmm. discreet. Mm -hmm. And um, and, I, and I think that it shows the most important lesson is in those in those letters. It shows that Muslims want to protect their own faith, and that if they see that it's being befouled, uh, uh, tortured, and tormented mm -hmm. by people who you know are dirtying their faith by the way they're acting in its name, uh, there are these corrective forces that will, will, will occur. Uh, if, if, if we had jumped in or the French had jumped in, uh, no doubt, you know, they would have made the situation much worse. And, uh, and I think that to me is a big lesson, is that we should tread very softly in, in our dealings with the Arab Muslim world and, and uh, let them settle their own hash, and, and, and that's what happened here. The, the Algerian government learned how to fight the war better, and they, uh, they, were, they got smarter, and the, and the population turned against them. This, this happened in Iraq, it will happen in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. it will happen in Pakistan, if we let it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if we keep you know, blowing up families and innocent people, that's just recruiting more and more people to the cause. And all you have to do is ask yourself, well, how would Americans react? If a foreign occupying army was in uh, Boston and, and uh, they were uh, trying to uh, protect you from some American right wing nuts and in the process were killing you know, your, your family and your friends and oops, sorry, that was a mistake. Would you be forgiving? Hmm. Um, yeah. I, mean, I, I think many intellectuals live in, in a world of uh, neo-atheism, neo-agnosticism, neo-skepticism. Um, everyone's read Dawkins, they've read Harris, uh, you know, they've read, uh, there's an entire literature, you know, in, of this genre today. Uh, what do you say to atheists, agnostics, skeptics who point the finger and say, well, that's what comes from that, right? I mean, there's so much good, perhaps, that comes from religion in the world. But there's also so much bad, so much evil. So like, why bother? Like, why get into that? Can't we just get beyond religion? Can't we get beyond all of this human attempt to come to grips with the divine and just be like secular humanists, <laughs> right? What, what, what do you say? In other words, what can atheists, agnostics, and skeptics learn from this story? Um. Well, I think maybe they can learn that there are self-correcting forces that you didn't find in Nazism, you didn't find it in communism, you didn't find it in American democracy when it was wiping out uh, two or three million Indians. That the secular religions uh, have probably done much more harm in the small time that they've been around. I mean, you could say, well, you know, maybe if you could count up all the bodies over the ages, you know, more have been done in the name of religion, but religion, you know, was the dominant way in which people related to, you know, the world until, what, the 18th, 19th century. So I would just say, yes, religion, uh, when it's, uh, you know, when it falls prey to, um, or doesn't heed the warning of St. Benedict, uh, his rule, uh, which I think is a, almost a universal prescription uh, for explaining w what goes wrong when he says, you know, uh, 
beware of the zeal of bitterness uh, that uh, separates us from God and leads to hell. Uh, anger that is essentially out of control is clearly the fuel in a lot of this. And then wrapped and justified in, in, in the cloth of, 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 of selective use of scripture. Uh, you know, he talked about uh, two categories of sort of wayward monks, uh, the girovogs who kind of just were moochers who wandered around and, you know, uh, beware uh, of them. <laughs> you know, they, they weren't really serious, uh, they were just taking advantage of other monks' hospitality. And then the Sarabites, who uh, were, uh, were an insult to their tonsors because they would go around declaring this holy and this forbidden based on their own sort of personal preferences. And, and of course, you can, you, know, you can usually read through anything and find the bits and pieces that support what you want to do or don't want to do. And everybody does it to some extent. Politicians do it. Journalists do it. Religious people do it. And... Um, but I would say the answer is, which is the lesser evil? And I think the, uh, when, when man starts to believe he's God, the amount of damage that uh, can be done uh, generally can exceed. There's, there's, at least there's a corrective built into, uh, it seems to me, those religions that have survived the test of time. If you look at the Catholic Church, I suppose you could say all the horrible things they've done, but yet they seem to right the ship, maybe... Now it's so right that you know mm -hmm. it's not relevant anymore. I mean, we've diluted religion so much in our culture mm -hmm. that you know you could say, you know, um, to me the Muslims who are fighting in the name of Islam are doing what we're doing in the name of democracy and, and patriotism. And if your home is, if your religion is essentially your home and your flag, then you're going to fight under the name of your religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and, he, and we still fight in the name of religion. You go to the uh, war memorial in Normandy, read the plaque. It's all about God. Mm. Uh, you read some of the things that uh, people who were killed, uh, uh, families and people who were fighting in Iraq and in Afghanistan have said, you know, saying, you know, I'm doing my duty to the country and to God, you know, and, you know. George Bush, and we were doing God's work. So God can be manipulated, abused, and, and uh, be, a, be a horrible uh, justification for doing uh, horrible things. There's no question about that. But whether we'd be better off if man, man was God, I don't know. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. We are, I think, uh, nearing the end now. And I think uh, maybe a question would be appropriate about um, uh, the situation today in Algeria, to what extent has, has the country, Algeria, uh, moved beyond or not moved beyond uh, the turmoil, the violence of the um, early to mid-1990s? Um, uh, is it safe? Uh, have you been there? Um, do you feel safe there? Um, can, can one travel there to get to know the country and the people? Uh, yes, it's moved on. Yes, it's relatively safe uh, uh, if you basically follow people's advice and don't go where you're advised not to go. Mm -hmm. um, they still have a lot of problems, economic and political, but I would say the population having undergone the horrors of 10 years of, you know, of, of, of terrorism and, 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 uh, and this, you know, Islamic insurgency, they're, they're the, they've been there, done that, and I don't think they want to have that come back. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you do hear there are, you know, there's Al Qaeda, Algeria, and the, the, there's a group uh, that, that, you know, waves that flag and has done some things in the name of, uh, of Al Qaeda. But I, I don't get the feeling that there's a lot of support and that uh, the government is, you know, I wouldn't say in control by any means, but anyway, that it's a marginal. There are a marginal element in the society today that get disproportionate attention because of uh, the way in which their acts are, 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 are covered in the press, um, although they weren't back in the 90s when nobody cared about Algeria. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the economy is still, you know, they've got problems with the economy, you've got problems with the Berbers and, and uh, cultural linguistic issues, but I get the impression that they're working on them, they're making progress, uh, that uh, uh, things are somewhat better, and um, 
uh, and tourists, you know, go down to Taman Reset and uh, mm. uh, go to uh, uh, Charles Foucault's uh, uh, retreat still. And in fact, when I was there two years ago, uh, I couldn't even get a, get in a hotel down in Taman Reset. There were so ah. many tourists. So mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. guess it's relatively mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, at this point, we'd like to thank you very much for this interview, and uh, we look forward to this evening's Kassasiakum Dialogue here at Marymount College. Thank you, John Kaiser. Thank you, George. Thank you. We got better. <laughs> uh,